and welcome to the first um, Industry 4.0 community podcast for 2024. I'm your host with the most, Walker D. Reynolds. The guest today is John Harrington, Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder at Highbyte. You guys hear me talk about Highbyte Intelligence Hub and data operations all the time. Uh, we asked John actually earlier at, at the end of last year, hey, would you like to be the first the first guest in 2024? Let's talk about, we, we want to go over our predictions for 2023. Did we get them right? We want to talk about the predictions for 2024. There's no no one better suited to help do predictions for 2024. And so we asked John to come on. We'd wanted to do this last month, but obviously with my surgery, we had to postpone it. So John, thank you for accommodating my schedule and welcome. How you been? I've been great. And uh, you look a lot better. So happy to see you. Happy to talk with you and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. So let, let, we're just going to jump right into it. I have a, a couple of announcements I'm going to do at the end. Speaking engagements, mastermind mentorship, all that kind of stuff. Kind of what we're going to talk about the high level here for those of you right at the very beginning. We're going to basically um, talk about three topics, okay, in general. So number one, we're going to talk about uh, why is UNS unified namespace as an architecture taking off. Uh, what I say is why is it mainstream now as opposed to why wasn't it mainstream three years ago, right? Um, we're also going to talk about specifically when it comes to data operations. There's a there's a unique, there's an interesting um, dynamic that you see at the beginning of an organization's digital transformation journey where they kind of want to do everything in their IIoT platform. They don't they don't want to use best in class outside of that. And and they ultimately have to for scale reasons. There's no way to, A, there are features that you're going to get from best in class solutions that you're not going to get from your IoT platform, but also for scale. You cannot scale to the enterprise level by trying to put everything in Ignition, for example, or put everything in Factory Studio or everything in in uh, WinCCOA. You, can, you can't do it. There's just no way to, to have the platform itself house everything, every transaction, every event, every everything. Um, so we're going to talk about that. How do you, when you're having conversations with clients about that, what does that look like? And then the last piece, we'll go over 2023 in review and 2024 predictions. All right. With that, John, let's just jump right into it. So Highbyte is obviously, um, you guys have been in business, it's four, four years now? Five? Five and a half. Five and a half. Okay. Product, so four years for the product, five and a half for the company. Right. So you guys, you're you're one of the first um, UNS products. I mean, yeah. I, in fact, I was trying to think, is there another product out there that was specifically data operations for unified namespace? And I think you guys, you guys are definitely got to be the first one. I think everything else, what we did was we we took something that was designed for some other function <laughs> and we made it work. Right. Yes. Um, you now have seen in 2023, the explosion and the adoption of unified namespace architecture. Why do you think that's taken off? What is, what is the, I mean, I have my own opinions, obviously, but from your perspective, why is UNS taking off now? Why now? Well, I, I think at some level we've hit a tipping point in terms of communication. You know, people have heard it, people can see, they can read about it, they can learn about it. Um, we've got analysts writing about it, you know, so there's, there's customers, there's system integrators, there's your channel in, in, in the discord and whatnot. Um, there's vendors, you know, uh, um, every, every company doesn't want competitors because they don't want to lose business. On the other hand, we need competitors because it, right. it, it amplifies the message. So, you know, I think the message has been amplified and, uh, like you said, a number of, of platforms that were designed as IoT platforms or were designed as SCADA platforms have adopted some of the UNS messaging and adopted a lot of data ops messaging. That's that's great. That's fine. Um, but I, I think, you know, we've just seen that that consolidation of analysts, customers, industry, press all come together and we finally hit a, hit a tipping point. One of the things that I've I've observed is if you look at the exponential growth, I mean, it's everywhere. I, I, I was just telling the team this morning, I'm like, you know, I, I, I almost get anxiety opening up my LinkedIn. Um, I, you know, my feed is just 
overwhelmed with UNS posts on UNS and, and I almost get anxiety because there's a lot of people out there producing great content, but there are also people I've never heard of who are making common, common mistakes, right? Like for example, I, I read the other day, um, in the discord server, um, a person who is actually really fluent in digital transformation said, well, you know, there, in order for there to be a new technological revolution, industry four, fourth industrial revolution, there must have been some technological breakthrough to make that happen. And since we don't know what the technological breakthrough was, then industry four never happened. And I was like, I literally read that and nobody spoke up. And I'm like, okay, first off, TCP IP winning the protocol wars in 1998 was the technological breakthrough, right? And I, and I think, I, and I think it's an important conversation to have right here. I don't think people understand just how big of a deal that was that TCP IP winning the protocol wars gave us the ability to just wrap any other protocol inside of TCP IP so that we could take Modbus, for example, which used to be just purely RTU, take Modbus and I can take Modbus and I can put it on an IT network where it can now talk to something within the IT infrastructure. Prior to TCP IP winning the protocol wars, that wasn't possible. Like, well, I don't think most people understand that. Like when you walked on a plant floor, you, you looked for the blue hose and the blue hose was the OT <laughs> network, right? And then you looked for the, the cat cables and that was the IT network, yeah. right? And I, I don't think most people <laughs> understood that OT and IT really were bifurcated because the, the networking needs for the operational technology were so different than the networking needs for the IT. And when TCP IP won the protocol wars, it gave us the ability to put the two together. And now I can take the data that's generated on the plant floor and I can combine it with the data that's generated in the IT infrastructure, specifically your business systems, and I can model it and then I can trend it and then I can make predictions, make decisions based on that, which is where data ops comes in, right? I mean, that is literally what data, data ops is. Take data in, do something with the data and output information and more data, right? Exactly. Um, let, let, so let me ask you this. What is holding UNS back? We know that it's exploding, right? But unified namespace, is, you know, we, we talked about this in the pre-production real quick, but what do we need to see change in order to see this, this wide adoption of UNS continue? or actually continue to scale from your perspective? So, I, you know, I, I think part of what's holding it, it, it our, our industry takes time to adopt new things. Yeah. And even when they do adopt, when a company decides we're going to try this out, it takes them time to evaluate and to get their heads wrapped around how it's going to work and how it's going to impact the life and move forward. Um, I will say two years ago, we were working with a pharmaceutical customer who's a mutual customer with us in, in Intellic. And I remember talking with, with their, um, their lead, their champion, and he said, I went and presented UNS to IT, and they said, no way, all data is going to the cloud. Right. What's interesting now is that all the clouds are saying, all the cloud vendors are saying, we're UNS now. Right. So, you know, everyone is saying data lake, we're UNS. Um, time series database in the cloud, we're UNS. So Snowflake, we're UNS. That, that's fine. Um, you know, and, and I think at some level, that's a good thing, right? I say to people, look, there's, there's a UNS, capital U, capital N, capital S, MQTT broker in the site, um, access to all your data, real time. And then there's unifying a namespace. Correct. And if we can leverage that UNS and unify the namespace of Snowflake or unify the namespace of S3, then that's goodness for the company and that's progress. And they can now leverage that data to drive forward. So, you know, I think we're just seeing a lot of broad adoption. Um, people saying, okay, this isn't like um, a wizardry. This is a very simple concept. We're standardizing and unifying data and providing a single access point for it. And normalizing and providing context, which yes. is the first step of like, in order for us to turn data into value for the business, we have to convert it into something actionable, right? So 
Yes. I, I always do these explanations. Like data is just something that happened and when. That's all it is. It's an event. It, it, you can't take action right. on data. Data is, without it being in context of something else, you can't, there's no way for you to make a decision or take action. You have to convert well, it into information to do that, right? And, and the challenge is context is often in the eyes of the consumer. Right, right. of the function, the consumer who cares about the function. Yes. So, so the, so if the UNS is just for OT, then the OT team can contextualize it. But if the UNS is being used by supply chain, R and D quality, sustainability, then when you move the data into the UNS, you need to contextualize it for those, those use cases. A good example would be what does everybody want to tie to? They want to look at, so let's use, um, we'll use sustainability, right? Um, I want to know how much, what my energy consumption is per unit produced, good unit produced. Yeah. Okay. OT doesn't care about that. That's not an OT consideration, right? That is an IT consideration. That go, That's higher up the stack. So, but, but when well, I- it's, it's an R&D consideration that IT needs to figure out, help them figure out. Right. Or, or IT needs to mandate is something we need. Right. Yeah, when you're yeah, when you're creating yeah, a minimum yeah. technical requirements and you're asking your machine builder to ship a machine, you want to make sure that that is one of the data points that's being calculated. Well, oftentimes, though, what is it that that machine builder needs in order to be able to determine what the cost of energy per unit is? Well, they have to know what you're paying for energy. And that oftentimes is dependent upon uh, a, that's data that comes from some other place. Well, contract and SAP. Right. And, and so. UNS gives you the mechanism to take OT technology and IT technology and yeah. on a common open infrastructure, plug them together so that yeah. we can do that, which IT asks us for, which is, I want to know how much energy we're spending per good part produced. And yes. I, I don't want an estimate. I don't want the accountants to try to give me a best guess at the end of the month. I want by part across the whole shift. So at when my when my, when I switch over to 11 p.m. and I'm on a different contract rate, I want to see my cost per part drop on that part, right? Because we're paying less for energy at that time. The, the, again, one just one example of a yeah. hundred million. We could come up with a hundred million examples, right? Right. And you think about okay, so we need we need to know how much power is consumed. We need to know, and and that's the telemetry. We need to know. What the what the part number is, and if it's serialized, what the serial number is, that's not in the PLC. That's in the MES system. We need right. to know our contract. That's in SAP, and we want to combine all of those because, by the way, tomorrow the contract may change, right. or you might even have the contract as a as a web service, right, right. coming from the 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 utility. Um, I remember I was at a uh, steel factory up in Montreal in the middle of the winter. And they said, you know, we shut this place down if it gets too cold because we can make more money shut down than running yep. because, you know, our, of our contracts with the utility. And so, that, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on with these big factories. Um, so, yeah, it's like data from multiple sources needs to be contextualized together um, and, and, and then landed wherever you can run, wherever the person doing the sustainability analysis is running that analysis. How do you, let me ask you this. How do you, to, I didn't even plan on asking these questions, but so <laughs> number one, when you are, when you're, when you go and you take high bite and, and you're talking to somebody who, you know, clearly they want digital transformation. They may want UNS. I mean, high bite is not, you don't have to use a UNS infrastructure to use high bite. I, I argue no. UNS is the best architecture. It's the one that scales. It works. It's what you should do, but you don't have to. You can use high bite with a, with a legacy infrastructure if you really want it to. I mean, you could just use it as a, as a service for moving data back and forth between nodes without it going into a UNS if you wanted to. But it, let's say you're going and you're talking to a client about high bite and, you're talk, and, and that, that conversation invariably is going to start with, data operations. How do you, I mean, what does that conversation look like? I mean, especially when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know what data ops is or the, or how, just how important data ops is to successfully getting the most out of digital transformation. How do you even have that conversation? 
I tried to ask Tori this, by the way, and she she demurred. She, uh, I mean, she told me, but she gave she demurred it. I and I think it was because the answer was a long answer, and she didn't have the time to give it to me. So now I'm putting it on you. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you have to start with either we have an initiative, or we have business problems that we're trying to solve. Right. right? Um, a lot of times, people are working and okay, we're trying. You know. We need better access to data. That, we have, you know, a, a, people. It's a lot often, of, oftentimes, the number one objection, number one thing is, I don't have access to the data I need. Right, right. Um, and so then the question is, okay, um, we often tell people start with use cases. What data do you need? Right. Who are you? Well, I'm the sustainability engineer. What data do you need? Where do you need that? Where are you working on that? Are you working in Snowflake? Are you working in a Excel spreadsheet on your laptop? Are you working in a Power BI dashboard? Where are you working? Do you want a Grafana dashboard? Are you an operator? You know, who is the persona? What data do you need? And then how do we uh, source that data? And then the challenge, you know, the UNS power is, well, if we're sourcing it for you, sourcing it for everybody aren't there a lot of other people that need it let's just put it in a central place you can pull it down everyone else can pull it down and and, uh, and we'll, we'll structure it in a way that. we'll structure it in a way where a person will, will teach them how it's structured therefore they'll know how to find whatever yes. it is they're looking for yes. without yeah. having to be taught exactly where is that data point well in you know by selecting the ic95 hierarchy Right. It's a highly logical, if you're familiar with factories, it's a highly logical approach right. to structuring data. Um, you know, I'm sure that you often get people saying, well, don't people want to look at it in a different way and look at it this way in this dimension? If I have an asset dimension or I have a process dimension, and you just think, well, the process data, you know, you have like line metrics, put them at the line. Right. It all doesn't go at the bottom. It, it, it can go at different levels. And you run your business based on different levels. You have a schedule for the line. You have right. a work cell that has part serialized data around it, like the cost. That cost data is at the work cell. That's right. where you would aggregate that. You've got predictive asset maintenance that happens at the line level. So you put data at the different levels and then people can go in and it becomes a very natural way to navigate the information. And I also will say, cre create whatever dimension you want. It, it, like you can create, you, you you can create as many namespaces and a unified namespace as you want to. There is no, right. you're only limited by disk and CPU and, and memory. That's it. I mean, um, and by the way, that's essentially unlimited. We can go horizontal scale and vertical, vertical scale and go as big as we absolutely want to. The, yeah, I, I have yet to hit a limit. Okay. And we've, and believe me, we're running some crazy benchmarks you know, billions of topics and still have not hit a limit yet. So, um, yeah. but what I say is build that demand, build that, that asset dimension you want to create, do it, do it. It can just be a sibling of the rule. So the rule is the red stuff. It's the ISA 95 hierarchy. It's the single source of truth. We're going to, your asset dimension that might be a sibling of that single source of truth in the, in the namespace is, is not, part of the single source of truth. It is a, an additional dimension. Use it however you want to. But as long as you're following the rules on the single source of truth itself. So that, because what's happening is if you look at the organizations that transform at scale, what they're doing is they're turning everyone into a, a citizen developer. They are turning everyone into a data operations or a data analyst. They're turning yeah. everyone into a resource for helping push digital transformation down the road. It's not, it starts out in a select team and then it gets bigger. Yeah. And then we, and then when we get to the CICD level, you have people generating their own topical namespaces and they, we call them blue namespaces, build whatever the hell you want, you know, use whatever tool you want. And, and if, and then the team is monitoring for the blue stuff the, your your digital transformation team is monitoring for all the new things that have been added, and they're going and then they're evaluating: is that something we should promote to the enterprise that we should be using everywhere on that asset, for example, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, let me uh, ask this question. I want to. I want to just to build on that real quick. Yeah, we see a lot of people having um, like they're they're using an enterprise wide system. They're using the cloud, and they want certain data to be standardized, normalized, contextualized in their in their cloud technology of choice, whether it's Snowflake or S three or Sitewise or you know. Azure. By the way, I'm becoming a bigger and bigger fan of Snowflake. We're seeing Snowflake in many of our, our uh, customers and prospects. Yeah, I, 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 th- I, think, I think Snowflake ha- has done a phenomenal job of just redefining what data lake and data warehouse is. I think that they've done a phenomenal job. I be- yeah. I, it, 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 it's a little clunky to get used to the workflow, but it, I, I think Snowflake, I mean, I, S3 was really my, you know, all of the AWS tools were really what we had been, yeah. But I, I'm becoming a much bigger fan of Snowflake, and and now it's becoming my de facto go-to in architecture. Now, did you try out our new uh, connector? I did, and we did right. we did a lesson for yeah. Mastermind in January. We're doing another one. We're actually doing a live lesson on March eighth. So we're actually going to do the live integration. Um, using our data. So you guys did your webinar, that 50 minute webinar or whatever, which was invaluable. I encourage anybody to watch it. In fact, Josh, let's make sure we link that webinar in the yeah. description for the Snowflake connectors uh, because you guys did both. So they're they're doing both streaming and SQL. So, yeah. so knowing when to use one versus the other is very helpful and the webinar explains that. Um, so we are gonna do the lesson on March 8th, doing the actual integration with our unified namespace. Um, yeah, let me let me ask you this this question. So, uh, before we get to how do you know you're talking to the right people? <laughs> All right, the probably the biggest challenge that I think we, we could just like link questions yeah. to questions because I was just going to comment on the Snowflake piece, but the only oh, thing no, I'll no, say go is, ahead and go ahead and comment on Snowflake. We have a customer who's already sending all their SAP data into Snowflake. They're using High by This is why we have the SQL query part. <laughs> to pull the SAP data, the order information out of Snowflake to deliver it down to the UNS, to give it to the operators so that the operators who are making the parts know who the customer is that they're making it for so they feel more connected and you know build higher quality product and are more one of focused the, on it. One of the big ones that we're doing, a little inside, I haven't talked about this yet, but since you brought that up, I'll bring it up. <laughs> one of the big ones that we're using Snowflake for is what we used to do was we would use Ignition's the most common IoT platform we use. I would say yeah. 80% of the time, Ignition is the IoT platform. Um, oftentimes what we're doing is we're using Ignition's SQL bridge to connect to IT and OT databases inside of the organization. And then we're doing some type of data ops inside of Ignition. Maybe we're running a query into a UDT or whatever. And then we're, and then we're using an MQTT transmitter using that edge of network node, that ignition edge of network node to send it to our broker. And then Highbyte is the, now we're using Highbyte to handle the data operations from the broker. We're not doing that now. Now what we're doing is we are either going data database directly to Highbyte, or we are going <clears throat> database and then we're using the migration tools, the replication tools to replicate our database in Snowflake and we're going snowflake, snowflake to high bite. But yeah. that is a fundamental change since you guys added the snowflake connectors in. Uh, I I was yeah, I was this last release three, three dot three is is that yep. the three dot three right? Yep. Yep. Um, but that's the new that's the change. Like what we're doing is taking all these data sources inside the organization and we're either putting them in snowflake and then pulling them out with high bite or we're we're connecting them to high bite and and interacting with all the, right. the data sources that way. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, let me ask you this question. So this is a obvious, the, in, the, the, one of the, that, that life sciences customer you're talking about. So I'm going to go speak to the FDA in a couple of weeks. So I'll, I'm going to be speaking at IFPAC in Washington, DC on yeah. March 4th. Right. And that whole venture is being put on, you know, like the, the primary speakers there are all from this life sciences company. That journey, that original journey, I think is a really important one in life sciences. So this was when we figured out how to do digital transformation 
in life sciences. We had, we had, we had done it for one of the big life sciences companies and we ended up with lots of internal holy wars. We, we did our UNS implementation. Then we had to hit pause so that they could use MuleSoft. You know, some architect wanted to use MuleSoft from Salesforce. Then they had, to, and it took him a year to do that. And then they had to compare the two before they decided, okay, now we're going to use UNS or go the UNS route. What we did with this new life sciences company we've been working with for a few years is we decided to work on their, on their PMPD side. So where they develop the drugs and where they develop the manufacturing operations. So most people don't know that when you manufacture a drug, you're man- generally you're manufacturing it in a bioreactor. Well, these drug companies, they have many bioreactors in these labs where they're literally building models of the manufacturing operation and then they're testing it. And so that when they put it in production, they, they're producing high quality drugs and they know that the process works. So we went this client called us and we went there to PMPD to do digital transformation so that they could just go, okay, now we're going to go over to the commercial side because we know right. it works. We can prove it. When that engagement first started, we pitched high bite. So we created an architecture. It was in January of whatever year, let's say 2021. I I'm assuming that's the year it was. It was January of 2021. And there was basically two people on board. There was the director who brought us in, And there was a young developer who was like 20 years old and he wasn't invested in anything they had there. Everyone else was skeptical. The whole IT infrastructure, the OSI Pi group, everybody was like, I, you know, I really question whether this is viable. I wouldn't say that there was anyone who was actively working against us. Everybody was operating in good faith and that was a positive. So we pitch high bite. We have ignition, uh, high bite, um, high MQ, um, I, I think we actually proposed EMQX. Uh, we uh, Kepware for device connectivity on the edge. Um, and one of the first things they did was they said, why do we need high bite? It was one of the first questions. They're like, and we're, we're making the data ops explanation, right? Why do we need high bite? Well, we can get away with building UDTs and ignition right now because we're doing a proof of concept. Yeah. But we cannot scale doing it that way. There's no way for us to scale doing it that we need the data operations needs to be handled in models in a separate platform. Okay. That, you know, that's just the, in order for us to be able to scale, well, they resisted. And so we had to do the initial proof of concept without using high bite. We had to, it took about five months. And once we delivered, once we delivered the, by the end of the fifth month, their entire team, I mean, 16, 17, 18 developers were all, 100% 100% true believers like UNS is the few and literally they they went and they presented to the entire company saying we recommend this be our future okay did this whole and that and now they're going and presenting to the FDA the exact same thing and I'll be speaking at that speaking at that conference on the fourth it only took them about three additional months for them to say oh we need high bite <laughs> in order for us to. So it took them six months to realize the value of the architecture. It took them three more months before they realized, oh, wait, you're right. We must have a separate data ops platform like high bite to do this. So which segues me into my next. This is obviously a huge challenge. People will have something like ignition or anything that will build UDTs, right? Data types. By the way, high bite doesn't just do data types. That's like one. You know, that's like yeah. one tenth of 1% of the functionality in the intelligence hub, right? How do you overcome that? How do you overcome when somebody says, why don't I just do this all in ignition? How, how are you explaining it to them? Because what we're having to do is if we can't convince them, we're having to wait for them to come to the realization on the, by themselves. And then we make the call. You know what I mean? But how are you guys overcoming that objection? And what is it we should tell the the community out there, hey, listen, you must take this step up front. Otherwise, you're creating technical debt you're going to have to undo later on. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. It comes up a lot in our discussions as well. How do we um, – I have a, a SCADA or I have an IoT platform. Why can't I just do that with them, whether it's Ignition or others? And, you know, as you know – I worked for eight years at Kepware. Um, I went to the first Ignition ICC back 12 years ago-ish, yep. 13 years ago. Um, 
you know, known those guys for as long, you know, for the last 15 years. Um, and, and they have a great product. What we tell people is ignition is it, what I tell people is you have to look at what are the key functions that you're trying that are in your architecture mm -hmm. and you have to identify quality solutions that meet the, that functional need. If all you're doing is collecting data in one location, and that's ignition. Great, you don't you don't need us. If everyone is going every every use that you'll ever have for data for industrial data is igni is is in ignition. Right. So ignition's connected to absolutely. Then then right. you can you know you can just just use ignition. You don't. And there's need only that. and there's only one ignition. That's that would be right. the other. Problem. There's one ignition. There's one site. Right. Um. Uh. It, you know all the data is telemetry data. Right. right. Um, but when you start saying, okay, well, I've got data in my ERP system, I've got data in a CMMS system, a quality system, and then the number of targets, I often focus people on who's going to use this data and what applications are they right. using? Right. Do you want to move it to the cloud? Do you want to move it to a local influx database with Grafana? Do you want to move it to... Um, to Snowflake, do you want to move it to, you know, your Pi system? A number of customers use us to move data into Pi. Yep. Um, lots of different use cases. Then you need something that focuses on moving data. And when you're focused on moving data, it's more than just moving data. You need to orchestrate the data. So you need to contextualize it, standardize it, normalize it. You need to provide quality data. So you need to be able to filter it. You need to be able to uh, make sure that if the connections go down and whatnot, you can recover it. You don't lose the data and it's very high quality, highly consistent data. You need to provide observability of the, all these flows. You now have hundreds of pipelines of data effectively. You need to be able to see them and then you need to govern them. And that's when, um, you know, when people start understanding, all right, it's not just about moving the data. Like that's, step one, but actually I'm going to spend more time maintaining this than I am setting it up the first time. And we have tons of tools to make setting it up the first time easier, but you're kind of in a, um, well, you know, everyone has a REST API or everyone has some sort of a solution for moving data, but to be able to contextualize it, standardize and normalize it for the target that it's going to and then to be able to provide high quality data and all the tools around data quality, all the tools around observability. I'm sure that you saw the new feature that we added to our pipelines where you could actually see the data payload transition from one stage yeah. to the next. So by That's the way, I, increase. one of my complaints about HiByte, and I'm very, I'm very careful about complaining. And the reason why, it, you know, I'm, I complain about everything, but I'm very <laughs> careful about complaining about HiByte because you guys are still so young. Like, one, somebody had asked me, you know, what my complaint is, is that to visualize, if you want to visualize everything that's going on in a high byte instance, okay, you have to know all the connections, you have to know all the models, you need to know all the flows, and you need to know all the pipelines and how they interoperate with one another. And then you yes. need to visualize that in your head, right? Because there still isn't a tool inside of the intelligence hub that visualizes that for you, right? When you added, by the way, when you guys added that feature in the pipeline, the first thing I said was, this is part of what's missing. Now, obviously, let me say this real quick. I don't need, so that you don't have to defend high bite. <laughs> you're, not, you're not going to That's, build. So I agree with you, by the way. Right. But you're not going to build that type of user experience until the platform is, you know, approaching maturity because you don't want to have to undo the development that user that ux layer that sits on top and represents visually what you've built is a function of how things are built under the hood you want to make sure what's under the hood is pretty mature before you do that so i do understand why that doesn't exist it's just that is a thing yeah. if there's anything people ask for it's i need a visual representation of what yeah. i've built you know what i mean and how it works no, so, so yeah so my comment the pipeline piece is visualizing the data transforming what you're talking about is visualizing the relationships that are built within the intelligence hub. 
Correct. And I agree with you. Um, I'll say it's on our list. Yeah. I'll say if we get on a call in a year and it's not there, then, you know, shame on us, hopefully much sooner, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> what mo yeah. Because it's interesting if you look at it, right? So what I've done is I use a mind map and I create yeah. a mind map left to right where I have a node for each connection and then I have an input for each of the inputs that's in a connection and then I map it in a, and when I'm when I'm building a huge high byte implementation, that's what I'm, I, in order for me to remember everything. But what most people don't understand, or maybe they don't think about it, in high byte, everything starts with an input on a connection and it ends with an output on a connection. And all yeah. the things that happens in the middle, oh, it's all the operational stuff, right? So yeah. there's always, it always starts with an input and it always ends with an output on a connection. And then yeah. your flow pipeline and models are all the things that determines how you're changing the input into the, the new output, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's yeah. a here's the thing. I, I was we were having this conversation about land and expand, right? Yeah. And how I believe the importance of getting software into the your software into the hands of as many potential clients as humanly possible, and then having those clients make the business case for why their organization should buy it by building some type of solution. So one of the things that we've been doing, um, we've recently signed a deal with Portainer.io. Portainer is a, you know, is essentially a container management platform. It's very yeah. common in like the homebrew space, but they, most people don't know that they have Portainer Edge, which is a big um, IOT or IIOT solution. In fact, there are many manufacturers that are using Portainer to deploy all their edge resources. So one of the things that we've started to do, we built a stat. Do you work? Have you played with Portainer at all? John? I have not played with them. I'm, I'm familiar with the company. Just um, Neil. ran into and talked a little bit with them at uh, Hanover last year. Right. So I'm going to be out, by the way, I'll be at Hanover this year. And actually I'm right. going out, I'm going to go out there and meet with Neil Cresswell, who's the CEO at Portainer. It's part of the, uh, you know, he said, hey, why don't you come out to Hanover? I will Jeff be out Schreiner there. and I are going out there, so we'll have to hook up. Awesome. My dude, yeah. the, uh, for the, uh, Schroeder, the for those, two, JS. that's JS. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but one of the things that we were, I have been doing is I've been building a stack using high Yeah. So in, in Portainer, you can create a stack that then gets deployed to an edge device in a container. And that stack basically contains, you know, think of it as like your Docker compose file, right? Well, one of the beauties of high that I don't think most people understand is you know, when you deploy high byte to a container, right? When you, when you, you don't have to deploy just a fresh install. You can take a data operation solutions you've already built. You can spin it up, deploy it. You can retrieve and ship the data and then you can take, tear the container down. And so what we've been working on is doing like this indexed approach where we're taking, you know, I, I'm using Portainer. I've got 20 edge devices. And what I'm doing is I'm spinning up my high byte instance on container one and then and on edge device one to do my data ops. And then I'm taking that container offline and now I'm redeploying it to two and taking it offline so that I can do the, I can create the sequence in which I want to collect my data and get it into my data warehouse. And it's a beautiful application, which we're going to demonstrate. It's a beautiful application on how you can really leverage containerization for rather than spinning up a resource and leaving it running for 99% of the minutes in a day where it's not even being used say, and this is specifically happening like on in oil and gas on contract applications. So mm -hmm. we're using high byte at contract right. hour, spinning it up, using it during contract hour, taking it down. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, it, it's a beautiful, elegant, implementation and and it's because you guys are using json under the hood right everything's yeah. json yeah it's it's because everything that you see in high byte is a is high byte consuming a json file all the every, so all you have to do is pass that file in as an argument in the stack and now you have your full configuration right you use persisted storage and then you spin the container up bring it yeah. down and you know it's 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 incredible it's 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 a Beautiful, beautiful data ops technology application. You started off talking in this whole conversation about TCP IP. Right. Containers are another technology. I would argue there's about five. There's multiple technologies that happen 
that we all combine to say industrial IoT or industry 4.0. Virtualization. Right? I mean, containers have just exploded in terms of the ability to deploy consistently across multiple multiple within a site and then multiple across across multiple sites. And um, one of the things we've really focused on is making the solution enterprise IT friendly, if you will. Right. So like what does enterprise IT do? Well, they use containers to deploy applications, especially if they have to put them on on prem. But they're right. driving it out of the cloud. The cloud is orchestrating everything. Right. Um, they're monitoring applications with things like Datadog to monitor log files, right? So we have the ability that you can push anything you want into the log file so that it can pull it out. Um, the ability to, you know, import and export configuration, the ability to pass that as an API from your CI CD process, all of that stuff, because in order to get to scale and govern processes, we need to get there. And when you think about pharmaceuticals, you've got like um, 21 CFR part 11, you know, mm -hmm. validated systems. You need to be able to make sure that it doesn't change. So you want to lock it down, but then you want to be able to push data into it when you have developed it, tested it and are ready to push it in. And, and so this is one, by the way, this is another reason why UNS is superior because the validation of 20, 21 CFR part 11 only needs to take place between node to UNS or broker and from broker to consuming node, two places. Whereas in the old days, it's there's a validation step at yeah. each handoff, right? Yeah. So, it, it, you know, 80% of your time is validating, but it's, it, yeah, it simplifies everything. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so let me ask you this. Do you guys are, is your go to market? Are you finding, obviously when you guys first went to market, you were focused on OT personnel and applications, yeah. right? Are you finding that you're gaining you're gaining more traction on the IT side, like introducing yourself to IT that way and, and going to market through IT, or is it still primarily an OT focus? No, so I would argue, I believe um, IT is holding the majority of the budget mm -hmm. that we're tapping into. Right, IT let, has yeah, the majority of the problem, yeah. right? IT is saying, I need access because what is IT is a service organization to the business. Hopefully. The business needs the data. So they've got the budget to go and get the data. Yep. Uh, that said, I always say to our sales teams, you need both OT and IT on the sales engagement as early as possible. Because if you get to where you think it's the end and you don't have both of them engaged in nodding their head, then the other one is nodding their head the other way and saying no. Yeah, they both have no... They both have to know how your platform solves their unique problem. Yes. Right. Yes. And now I would, we would say we make OT's job easier because they're being asked to deliver data. Yes. And they have to. And, and so by having a platform that they can easily just set it up, they can replicate it multiple times. They can essentially inject their domain knowledge into the platform so that the data lands contextualized and usable. Um, is powerful and it's powerful, it, you know, it, with all the scalability tools that we've built out in terms of templating and all that kind of thing. So the OT users tend to be the users or the majority users of the system. IT may create some models, but beyond that, OT is doing all the contextualization and, and data pipelines. But IT paid for it and because IT needs that data. So it's more of an in infrastructure play. So one of the questions I had for you was, how do you know you're talking to the right people? Right. And, and yeah. so I think you've partially answered it already. Right. So you want to be talking to it departments who define themselves as service organizations rather than security yeah. and compliance first. Right. You want to be talking yeah. to o OT, OT groups that have specific problems they want to solve and they have the capability to solve them themselves. They just need the tool to do it. Any, any other traits of the right people, when you know you are talking like, hey, this is, you know, I'm not going to have to teach them from the very beginning what is data and get it all. You right, know, you know right, how right. do you know you're talking to the right people? Um, that's a good question. I mean, certainly if people say, well, we don't really have anything connected yet, you know, that's a whole nother 
Right. They need to mature themselves. Because data acquisition is- In a year or two or three, they may be ready for us, but right now they're not ready. Um, So think, uh, I would say thinking along the lines of scale, people who are thinking, how do I, how do I do this at scale, both within my facility or across my enterprise, those are generally the people that care. If all they have is one small discrete problem, um, it, it's, you know, it's less of a, a good opportunity for us. But then, you know, it could be that we have to just talk to other people within the org, but you definitely want organizations that are talking digital transformation, industry 4.0, you know, but they're looking at new technologies and how do I use new technologies to drive my business? Here's a, here's a, for those of you who are wondering, you know, the, asking the same question. And, and a, a lot of these questions I'm asking are questions that have been asked of me. Hey, Walker, <laughs> on the high bite thing, you're so high on them and everything. Yeah. You know, I, I say this, you know, a right customer is, A, IT needs to be a service organization. I agree. The right customer is somebody who's already got an OPC server yeah. in play. If they got it, I mean, it is a no brainer. If they've got a huge OPC infrastructure and you just take high bite, you literally can convert that OPC infrastructure to an IIoT protocol like MQTT just by adding high bite and, and bolting it onto the OPC server. I mean, I do it all the time. I and mean, I actually do and it. You in, can do it in 10 minutes. Right. You could do it immediately. Literally convert it into an IoT infrastructure yeah. just by bolting high. So that's A is a right customer. When they have like a big, you know, sprawling yeah. OPC infrastructure, that's a perfect no brainer. Here's the other one. It's the one where they've where they're relatively mature. They've got an IoT platform and they're and they're and it's a platform for solving problems. They have a namespace or a unified namespace. And what they really want to do is they want to get their data into their data lake across multiple sites. So I've got multiple sites. Yeah. I want to stream in context, normalized. Of all the tools out there, it is the easiest using Hybyte. Standardize the data across it's, a standard model, across multiple sites, multiple deployments. Correct. It's easiest using high byte. If you and I would even argue, it is it is more elegant than even using the connectors that are in ignition. And I love ignition's connectors. I'm not trying to pit the two, but you know I, I'm walking a fine line here because these are questions that people ask. You know, it, yeah. it, it comes up all the time. How do I decide whether to use UTs <laughs> and ignition or use models and high byte? You know, it's it constantly. How do I know whether to use the AWS or Azure connectors in in ignition versus using high bytes connectors. Well, the answer is is that you're ultimately going to end up using high byte. Like whether you decide to do it now or later, outside of the case where it's one plant, one infrastructure, and the IoT platform can talk to everything, outside of that use case, you are ultimately going to need an external data ops platform. You're going to have to have it. There's no way around it. We don't have any examples of enterprise scale where all data ops is being managed through an IoT platform. It just there's no examples. It, you, you know, Ignition, for yeah. example, can't h- handle the overhead. Just garbage collection alone becomes problematic, you know, pro- programmatically. Um, go ahead. Sorry. You had commented on Ignition UDTs versus high byte models. And I would say if you're modeling for Ignition, for th- screens, you know, displays. Or, pro- or process control. Then, I would say. Exactly. For process yeah. control. Use the UDTs, create right. UDTs for process control. Now, in doing that, you're actually going to standardize some of your data. You're going to contextualize right. some of the data. Um, if you, we can pick up those UDTs right. and use them. You don't have to re. Don't think that you have to remodel within Hybyte. We right. just take that as an as an object, add additional context if needed, and then deliver it to where it needs to go. Right. And then if you want to remodel the data because the process control data came in looking like this, but I want to use it for quality. And if there's a programmatic way of of making that shift, we can make that really easy too. Like every UDT that is a motor, I want to pull out these two um, telemetry points and I want to put them in my quality and I want to add some additional stuff out of some other systems in the movie. Like we can pro- programmatically define all that, and it just accelerates your deployment in, in intelligence health. Yeah. So you know, it, on the other hand, 
um, don't clog up your ignition system with UDTs that are really for Power BI dashboards. Right, right. exactly. Do it, that it, in high That's what, you know, people say, I say, every system has an ability to do some level of modeling for themselves. We model for every other system. We don't use the data. We just move the data, but we, you create your models based on the target that it's going to. Let, let me ask you that. If you look at the number, I, I went through and I read all the release notes for all your releases last year. Yes, yeah, so I, I read yeah. bu fix, bug fixes, features, the whole deal. And yeah. I, all said and done, I don't know, 130 something features, I think it was, that were added in yeah. a year, right? Um, it, was, it was well over 100. I think it was 132, 133 features, which, by the way, is impressive. I mean, that's very impressive to add that many features in one year. The well, engineering team crushes it. Yeah. And, Aaron and his team. So one of the challenges that you guys have is that you are a, you're bleeding edge technology that's being used predominantly by legacy organizations initially, right? Because they're the ones who have the immediate need for being able to take legacy data and model it for, um, you know, uh, industry four applications. How do you, how do you guys weigh Obviously, customers come to you with feature requests all the time. I need X, Y, and Z. Sometimes they're asking for features that they don't actually need. And, the, and in fact, you don't actually want to build because that steers them in the wrong direction, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> because they know what they know, right? You guys can see the long game. They, the, the legacy organization still, they're still pulling the wool over their, off their eyes, right? How do you guys weigh that? How do you... This is like an inside baseball piece. As a customer, as a user of the platform, and I think a lot of people have this question, how do you decide what feature to build and what feature to say we are definitely not building? It's one thing for it to be in the backlog. It's another thing for it to have a strike through, right? We've decided we're not building that feature. How do you guys weigh that? Um, yeah, so myself, Jeff, Schroeder, and Aaron, are constantly looking at new features. What do we want to do? Aaron leads our our, our engineering team. Um, so we're we're weighing that. And the question is, is that a data ops feature or is that something else? Is that an ERP feature? Is that a, a IoT platform feature? Should they be doing that in Intelligence Hub? Right. We had someone who wanted to run collect data for all their machines. Like we're, we're being asked more and more to almost develop an MES system. Right. And so we're trying to put up some guardrails there. Are you moving data? If you're moving data, yes. If you're not moving data, you know, and you're just loop, you know, we're running calculations on data and whatnot. Um, are we storing, you know, what's the storage mechanism, what's going on? So, we look at that. We also have a vision of where we think it needs to go and where um, where we want to take it. And and we talk with our our customers. Some some as our new customers. You know, we're we're always evaluating new capabilities to grow our sales. But some of it is our older customers who, you know, we so <clears throat> last January or February we released version three. Mm -hmm. We're currently started development on version four. In between, we added a lot of features, right? With version three, we had things like the broker, we had um, the uh, REST horizontal uh, data scale. server, we added right. the UNS client and all kinds of other stuff. Right, added in horizontal, the ability to manage horizontal scale. Yep, right. yep. So with version four, we're actually going, um, you know, you've talked about the ability to visualize what you've done. You've talked about right. the ability to, we're moving to the masses. Our, our users are telling us, our biggest users are telling us, look, it used to be that the team that was working with Intelligence Hub was this core small team who were very innovative. And they built everything. Adopters, they right? built everything and they knew how everything was built. Exactly. Right. Now, um, it's not just the early adopters. It's a broader range of people. They're at the sites and we need to simplify the user experience for them. And so... You know, we're, we're taking a step back and we're saying, what do we need to do to deliver that? What do we need to do to deliver a UNS? Interestingly, many of the UN, you know, like an MQTT broker 
you don't really define the structure and then put the data in. You <laughs> define the data and then tell it where to go. Right. And, and so, you know, we're, we're looking at, well, that's, that's a little backwards. Let's define a namespace and then allow you to assign the data. And by the way, the advantage of that is that you can then programmatically start like zipping the data in and you can say, well, if any data looks like this, you can run queries and, and things like that. So really taking a step back, looking at usability, um, looking at UNS and namespace building, and then being able to just say, all right, I want to reflect this over MQTT. I this other customer wants to reflect that into SiteWise. Another one wants it to go to Snowflake, and the third one wants a REST API that looks, and they all should be identical namespaces, and you just have different modes of accessing them because of the way that the customer wants to interact with the data. So really taking that to the next level. Let, let's talk about uh, one last thing. Let me ask that. I want to make sure I ask this yeah. question. If you could teach your potential clients or your current clients anything, if there was one lesson you could create and make sure everybody took that lesson and they learned, they learned what it is you were trying to teach, what would that be? So what, if, if, if you're like, Hey, this, this would help people get over the humps, get over the hump and understand the value of data ops, unified namespace. What would that lesson be? What is the thing you would teach them? That's a great question, Walker. Um, the, the value of architecture and abstract abstractions and the ability to, you know, you don't want to create these monoliths. Right. Because you need agility. Yes. And think about how much things have changed in the last five years in terms of like, what were the motivations for your supply chain? What were the motivations for your product engineering? What were the motivations for your different teams? You need agility. And in order to do that, abstracting systems, making them very agile and, you know, thinking about how we not only have applications, but also um, manage the data flow in between them is, is what you need to think about. And just getting them to, to not just think, Application, application, that's all I think about. To think infrastructure will enable you to be so much more agile in your applications. Yeah, and I, I would say, I, I actually thought about this when I wrote the question. I'm like, what, man, what would I? And I, I think I would teach one of two things. So number one, it would be, I would teach that the lesson that in, in Industry 4 and, and in subsequent revolutions Data is your primary commodity. I know it's hard to believe that. Yeah. I know I know when you make widgets, it's really hard for you to imagine that data is the most valuable thing that you have in your business, like the digital data that you're not collecting. I remember this guy, I was speaking in Denver, and he said, there's all these devices out there that are talking and you ain't listening. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's such a great lesson. The The value that data is your primary commodity in the in the business of the future and the business of the present and i think the se secondarily behind that it's if i were to teach the lesson that you must think of all solutions as one part of a much larger whole no matter what problem you are trying to fix you must think of it as i'm trying to solve something as that's going to be just one part of a much larger whole and i think yeah. by the way that mindset has changed more and more people are thinking, you know, you talk about how things have changed in five years, five years ago, people were still thinking in very much in turnkey. This is an isolated problem. I'm going to qualify what the problem is, send out a request for proposal, you know, put it, put together a waterfall schedule. We'll deliver it and the problem will be solved. And we'll never ask the question, how does this solution fit in the rest of our business? It just solved a business problem. I would say a lot of people have changed their mindset. They understand problems are being solved within ecosystems now. They're not being solved in turnkey solutions. All right, with that, let me go to, uh, I want to go over the 2023 review. We're, we're going to be a couple minutes over, but so we had three primary predictions for 2023. And I, I want to go over what those predictions were, ask you if you think we, we, you know, we hit the nail on the head and then let's talk about what our predictions are for 2024. So 
number one, I said that ChatGPT will drive an explosion of growth on Twitter, LinkedIn, Medium, and Reddit. You'll see a lot more engagement in social media, a lot more reinforcement of existing ideas, and you'll see a lot more noise. I would, I think no one is going to argue that that's not the case. That absolutely 100% happened. I think it went beyond those three platforms. It went yeah. everywhere. It went everywhere. Yeah. I mean, yes. um, it, and, 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 you, and uh, back to my point on the LinkedIn thing, I love LinkedIn. I love spending time there, but I find myself getting almost anxious when I get ready to open it. Cause I'm like, I just don't even know what I'm going to see now. Um, <laughs> Number two, we said unified namespace adoption will continue to expand exponentially. So the number of articles from 2021 to 2022 blew up. And then UNS has been driving success in industry four and has had a huge impact on the way Accenture has gone to market, McKinsey, Deloitte, and Microsoft. I would say the big deal is, I mean, there is a, there's a link that we're going to put down below. There's two links we're going to put down there. One is going to be the link to the webinar that Highbyte did on the Snowflake integration. The other link is going to be a conversation that Rob Tiffany, I want to make sure I, I get all the names right. Uh, Rob Tiffany, um, uh, I don't know who else was on there. Um, is but there like is a IoT coffee hour or something. Yeah, it was the IoT coffee hour. And they talked about why Microsoft failed with their three IoT products, Azure IoT, IoT Hub, and IoT Central. Yeah. And this is a lot of, these are Microsoft guys and they're talking about the bullshit that was going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And even, even to the point where they were saying, listen, we knew it was garbage. Our customers knew it was garbage. They kept coming back to us telling us it's garbage. And yet we kept telling everyone it wasn't. And I, I, I'm going to include that link down below. You know, Microsoft realized to their credit, Microsoft realized they needed to go back to the drawing board and they did, you know, they, you know, it costs a lot of people their jobs. They went back to the drawing board and they adopted UNS. If you look at their new reference architecture, it is a unified namespace architecture. They built their own tools, including, you know, they built their own MQTT broker, their own OPC UA discovery server, and, you know, bolt those two together. You know, they, Microsoft to their credit has realized the error of their ways. Um, now, do I, does that mean I have faith in Microsoft? Of course not, but um <laughs> It, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, I was looking at this. I had no fewer than two dozen books sent to me on unified namespace. People just unsolicited sent them to me, you know, and there would be a place in there where they mentioned me and they wanted me, you know, me to review it or whatever. So yes, I would argue, you know, in 2023, yeah. UNS adoption absolutely exploded. And the last one is digital supply chain. And this is probably the one that we, I, I said, digital supply chain will begin to alleviate just-in-time issues. This is our path forward. And, and digital supply chain is the idea that we take digital infrastructure of an organization and, you know, we do the Tesla model. Tesla is digitally connected to all of their assets, all of their manufacturing operations, and all of their potential customers all at once. It, it is not a linear supply chain. It is a hub and spoke, and it's all digital. Um, all their vendors are connected to them. There, there's no, they don't get on the phone and, and ask for lead times on, you know, they don't call St. Cobain and go, what's the lead time on that last order of, uh, of, um, you know, windshields, uh, yeah. you know, they're what they're, they have a unified namespace where St. Cobain is publishing the updates and my, and, and Tesla's reading it out of the UNS. Right. Um, so, I, but I would say that we didn't see, I guess it does begin to alleviate. Uh, so I, I would say we were probably, we got it right, but it, that's the one of the three that we saw the least impact. The first yeah, two, I think, I think it's still coming. I yeah. think it's still coming. Um, we've talked to some companies, yeah, in the automotive space who are exchanging data, and in the pharmaceutical space. The interesting thing about pharmaceuticals, you probably know this. I never knew it until until Highbite and I started talking with a lot of them. Is this whole CMO and CDMO? Right. Um, or is it is really driving massive volumes of pharmaceuticals in our country and across the globe. And there's many great reasons for that, but their ability to share. And so it's really interesting when we've got pharmaceutical companies and we've got CMOs or CDMOs that work with them. Right. And now they're starting to say, how do we share this data back and forth? And how do we make sure that we're sharing the right data um, that it's going to the right place and we're able to control that. And again, that goes back to moving data, contextualizing data, making sure, having visibility that it's going to the right place. So, yeah. 
So let's talk 2024. And I would love to hear, you know, your one or two or three predictions for 2024. And then I'll, I'm just going to give my one big one. Um, But the, I'd love to hear what you think, you know, because you guys are now, you know, your organization is mature enough now and the platform is mature enough now where you are, it's, you have legs, you have real legs, right? And, you know, the, the growth curve is, is an exponential growth curve now, right? Yeah. 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 What do you see 2024 looks like what to you, if you were going to talk about the predictions for the industry around industry four and digital transformation, what is one or two things that you're like, Hey, you know, I think AI and ML continue to outpace and drive adoption and excitement and interest, which is a good thing. Right. I mean, people are doing phenomenal things with it, and that's only going to increase. And and by the way, selfishly, in order to make those things work, you need highly contextualized, highly normalized, high quality data Correct. streams in order to deliver them. So, you know, that's a great um, outcome for High Byte because people need that data. Um, the other thing that I would say is it's 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 getting it's getting the data into the masses and it's, you know, like we, we've talked about on this, it's, it's not just about the early adopters anymore. Mm -hmm. It's how do you think about the product, our product? How do we think about the UNS? How do we think about data consumers? Where are they, where are they located and how are they going to get access and use that data? And so it's, it's uh, moving beyond early adopters into that, that early majority that, needs access to the data, needs access to the systems, um, you know, thinking a lot about the target for the data. A lot of the articles that I saw on UNS over the last year who were written in many cases, I mean, we wrote some of them, many of them were written by system integrators. They all talked about building the UNS. Right. And we've started to talk about using the Using UNS, it, yes. Taking the data out of the UNS and putting it to work. Because we started looking around saying, you know, MQTT is awesome, but there's only so many applications that still support that that support MQTT well. And there's even fewer that support Spark Plug B. So we need to be able to take that data out and we need to, if it's going to the operations team, that's great because you've got Ignition and, and they do a great job with Spark Plug B. But if it's going to the business and the IT systems, we need to get it out of Spark Plug B and we need to get into something that's much more consumable. Here's another, Here's another we were just talking about this, man. We we're literally in the conference room before I came in here. Um, we were talking about one of the limitations of Ignition with MQTT is that by default, Ignition is an edge of network node with Spark Plug B. So there's no mechanism out of the box to publish vanilla MQTT out of Ignition. Yeah. So you have to write code to do that. You got to use Python to basically generate, take the tags, turn them into flat topical structures and publish them separately. Everybody does it. They run it as a gateway event script, however they do it. But the point is- You publish Spark Plug B and then you have High Byte consuming it and doing the conversions. Which is how we do it now. So yeah. my point is, is that what we do is instead of using Ignition in the center, what we're doing is we're moving it off to the side and high byte is in the center, right? And then high byte is the one that is doing the data transformation from ignition to a flat MQT. Because by the way, little known fact, when it comes to spark plug B, the higher you go up the stack, the less you use it. Okay. So yeah. by the time you get to L4 and L5, you're that's that namespace is vanilla. It's, it's a flat MQTT topical um, structure. I, I want to talk about my prediction is it is the artificial intelligence ML piece. And, and here's why one of the things that we've been, the two things that I think we're going to see an explosion in is actual ML applications from digital data in manufacturing. Right now it's gotten so easy. It's after the snowflake connector came out. Um, so what we're doing is we're streaming namespaces through high bite into snowflake. Okay. And we're creating schemas based on specific functions. So we're not just dumping everything into one table, right? We're creating right. schemas right. based on functions. 
And then what we're doing is we're collecting that data over, say, a month. And then for our client, what we're doing without even the client, you know, maybe the client doesn't even have a snowflake instance. It's ours. And maybe they don't have high bite. Maybe it's just ours. And we're just going to prove to them, here's how we do this. We have a data scientist here who just goes and looks at our client's unified namespaces and goes, oh, here is an ML application that might work for them. I can create a linear regression between these two data points, right? He knows nothing about it, but be based on relationship and normalization and context, he can do it. So what we're doing is we're taking, we're running a query inside a Snowflake that gives us a result set from the schema. Then we're dropping that result set into ChatGPT and we're saying to ChatGPT, here's what we want to try and do. Here's what the data looks like. And it is that that row that I just gave you is inserted every 50 milliseconds, whatever it is. To give me a wireframe of an algorithm that I would use to find a correlation, a relationship between this value A and this outcome B and or this value X and this outcome Y. And ChatGPT is spinning out the solution for us, not just not just the wireframe, but it's spitting out the the integration steps. And then it's writing the code. And then what we're doing as, as, as architects is we're moving it from one place to another. Well, if we're doing it, everyone else is doing it too, right? I mean, there are people at the end users who are doing those same things. And so we are going to see when you start going to manufacturers, you're going to start going to manufacturers more and more, and you're going to see more and more ML applications from their digital data that, is, that are yielding actual, like real value. Why? Because contextualized, normalized data that's streaming. That's, yes. that's no, number, it, no question that's going to happen. I think the real edge thing is I think we're going to see a resurgence of augmented reality. And I, I, know, I hate to say, say this because it was such a disappointment, but it, it, uh, more and more people are going to be having this, you know, because of the Apple whatever pros. And then I don't think that that augmented reality was ever going to be lenses. I think Neuralink is how is the path to real augmented reality. When you're wired into someone's brain, you can overlay whatever the hell you want to on their eyes. And I and there are going to be more and more representative examples of those types of applications in our life. Imagine you went to a, a conference, you know, I'm at Hanover Messy and I have a Neuralink and everyone's opted in to share their their information with me. I could literally walk through Hanover Messy and see your LinkedIn profile over your head, your name, your title. You know what I mean? I could literally filter the audience in in seconds. And if I can do that through a neural link in my brain, imagine what I could do with vision technology inside of my manufacturing facility. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think ML ML is the is the big piece. We're gonna see an explosion of ML applications in 2024. Yeah, and I think Chat GPT makes that so much simpler right so we've got like ai making ai even easier it's, excel it's the acceleration of the learning process like the nvidia ceo said the other day that you know people should stop learning to code i disagree i i, I there's a huge difference between um writing code long form being that your future and understanding how to code so that i can then supervise code that has been written by artificial intelligence, right? But in either way, I got to know, I have to know how to write code, right? I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, you, we can't just, we're not just going to blindly, you know, how do you debug the output from artificial intelligence, right? I mean, you have to know how to code in order to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 what I see though, is this acceleration in a, a, AI is a force multiplier, but the big thing is there's this acceleration in in knowledge transfer. You know what I mean? I can, I can turn you into a data analyst, John. If you're not a data analyst, I could turn you into a data analyst in a week. If I'm using the right platforms, right? If yeah. I'm, you know, and if I'm using the right platforms, I could turn you into a data analyst in a week. And then the week after that, I could turn you into a data scientist, right? Yeah, and, it just simplifies it. And we couldn't say that. We couldn't say that three years ago. So, all right. Any parting... Right. Parting words, anything you wanted to mention before we uh, we call it a day? No, I mean, uh, we're, we're just excited for this new year. I mean, um, we've got a lot of bold plans in terms of uh, product. Mm -hmm. We have bold plans in, in just the, the market is just 
it's cresting and it's just, uh, it's the, the number of people who contact us who said, we want to learn more, we want to understand better. Um, and, and just, you know, they have such a broader range of how, of how they're planning on leveraging uh, solutions. It's, it's just really exciting. And, um, you know, I remember five years ago when you were starting to talk about unified namespace and I was like, God, that looks a lot like what we're talking about and doing, planning on doing. And it was early days and people didn't get it, but now it's just, uh, it's great. It's exciting. Um, sometimes it's like, you know, who do I respond to? But uh, yes. it's, there's, there's a lot going on, man. It's, it's exciting. Well, John, I, I got a couple of announcements real quick. So mastermind session is March 8th. So Friday, March 8th, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, I will be teaching that mentorship is March 15th, nine o'clock in the morning. I do not know who's teaching. I don't know if it's me or if it's somebody else. I'll be speaking at IFPAC in Washington, DC on March 4th. I will be giving the keynote address, I think in the morning, and then I'll be sticking around for a couple of hours with my flights at like three. So if any of you are in DC, come out and check it out. The FD, it's a, right across the street from the FDA building. I'll be speaking at the Dallas IoT Happy Hour April 4th. I do that. I do a speech there every year. Um, so those of you who are at UTD and all the surrounding universities, please come out. And I'll be giving a keynote for the Digital Transformation Forum in Boston on March or on May 1st. Are you guys going to be coming to that, John? The Digital I'm Transformation sorry. Forum in Boston? It's uh, May 1st. I don't know. Hey, Josh, we'll, do we'll me a favor. Make sure we send send the info to John and Tori please. Um, and with that, uh, it's good to be back. Um, if you guys want to know, I, I strongly encourage you to go to High Bytes website and take a look at the release notes for the latest version 3.3. <coughs> um, if you guys are in Mastermind, you're definitely going to want to increase your fluency with High Byte. We're going to be using High Byte quite a bit over the next four or five months. Even when we bring Litmus Automation in, we're actually going to be using Litmus with high bite in conjunction with high bite. So um, uh, with that, thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, comment down below. John, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you, brother. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.